We are now going to return to our drainage network editor to look at the settings for flooded width calculations. Going and picking up our network editor again, selecting our network, middle mouse accept, we're going to our storm analysis. Now we're going to look at the flooded extents tab. We had this turned on for our calculations and what 12D is going to do first of all is going to create polygons indicating the flooding extents at our sag ponds. Now these are going to be colored cyan and it's going to be 20% transparent so we can look through it. Flooded widths, the flooded widths are going to be calculated along and perpendicular to our overland flow path. Now these ones are going to be colored cyan and the edges are going to be connected. The reason we connect the edges is in case you want to triangulate them to create a water surface. The next is the cross sections themselves. The cross sections as we mentioned are cut perpendicular to your flow line and have a length indicated down here in cross section length. And also the separation between them is setting at two meters. Now these cross sections we're going to trim them off at a levee. A levee is any point well, we'll come back and talk about levees once we look at a cross section. You also have the option not to do any kind of trimming or to trim them at the overflow. We're going to leave that as trimming them at levees. The flooding width warnings. We're creating these cyan bars for the flooded widths, but in a separate model, we'll create yellow bars if the flooded width ever exceeds the limit indicated over here on the right for maximum width. So any flooded widths larger than two meters will get a two meter wide bar created in this warning model. The next comes to hazards, depth times velocity warnings. We look at the, veloc the maximum velocity times depth at any one of the sections and if it exceeds the value here of 0.6, we create a dark red bar inside this model here. Finally, discharge warnings. We take a look at the cross sections that are generated and locate the lowest overflow point. The discharge when the water level reaches this overflow point is considered the road capacity. Now whenever the discharge exceeds this road capacity, you'll get a red bar indicating that problem inside this model. Now when we do our calculations, we're always doing normal depth calculations. That is, we're looking at the road grade along your overland flow path and then calculating the normal depth, not backwater calculations. So in order to do these, this grade, we will not use a grade that's less than 0.05%. So if it's less than that, 0.05 is the grade that will be used. Keep in mind, if the grade is getting this small, you're most likely going to be into backwater calculations and it would be a good idea not to use results in this area at all. The end value that we're going to be using is 0.015 and if you can use a Manning's Q correction factor, AR and R suggests under some, some circumstances that you should reduce the capacities calculated by the Manning equation and therefore that's what this value is for. This last tick box, it says contain overflow within the levees. If you go and have a discharge that is greater than your road capacity, this will extend vertical walls in order to hold the water levels inside that section. Therefore, your depths will become greater and you have a chance of getting higher depth times velocity. So we'll turn that on as well. Now let's go and run that again. So it's recalculating those. We'll go back to the editor, select finish to give us some more room. We're going to go and hide this and let's go look at some of the results. Now let's look at the results that are calculated from our flooded widths. To make this a little clearer, I'm going to turn off these catchments. So I'm going to turn off this DWG catchments. And now I'm going to come back and add on the first of our flooded widths. And that is our sag ponds. Now we've only defined one sag pond location and that was here at inlet 06. So what we're seeing here is the amount of flooding before the water bypasses and flows down the road. This will only happen at sag pits. Now we're going to come on and go to our next set of results and we're going to look at our flooded widths. The flooded width calculations, if we zoom out a little bit, will have this very typical sawtooth pattern. Essentially what 12D does is assume that at the top of the flow path we have zero discharge. As we move down along this overland flow path, by the time we get to the bottom, we have a maximum approach flow and we assume that the discharge changes linearly. As we calculate the normal depth along here, 
we're using the slope along your overland flow path to calculate that normal depth. Now, once again, as some of the water goes into your inlet, we do have some bypass, so it doesn't go back to zero. And now we assume the flow goes from that bypass flow down to the total approach flow at this bit. At this moment, we should talk a little bit of what would happen if we had approach flow coming in here from the north. Because 12D doesn't know where these flow, approach flows are coming from, it currently assumes that 100% of the approach flow is used for this calculation here, and we know the bypass. So, as you approach here, your flooded widths are going to be slightly overestimated where you have converging overland flow paths. Now, if you'll notice once again, we've got these flow paths coming out here. Now, as we go across here, we've got our bypass flow, but it's not increasing because we're not going down to another catchment. Therefore, we have the flooded width just going across this section of the road. If we look on our southern side of the road, our capture is approximately 100%. Therefore, we go back to a flooded width of almost zero. Now, we set our maximum flooded width as being two meters. Let's go back and add on any flooded width warning bars that we have. So, we're looking for a drainage flooded width, width warning, W. And on the southern side of the road, we have no trouble at all. On the northern side of the road, because we have these huge catchments coming in, we definitely have flooded width warning bars. As a matter of fact, we can't go very far past this inlet before we exceed the two meters again. Obviously, on the northern side of the road, we need more inlets. Let's go turn off those warning bars right now. And let's go back and add on our cross sections. The cross sections are the cross sections that were cut. Let's go back and take a profile through these so we can take a look at how our levees work. We're going to go to our section view. I'm going to select the profile button, back to our plan view, and select one of our cross sections. Let's go back to that section view and see what we have. You can see what 12D has done. It's got that full section that has been cut, and it all of a sudden stops at the center of the road. Let's take a look at what the tin does as it, if it extended farther. We're going to the settings buttons for our menu, for our view, pardon me, down to settings, and we're going to change our extend. We're going to ask 12D to extend to the left another 10 meters, and we might as well extend to the right another 10 meters as well, and select set and finish. So what we can see is on the right hand side, the cross section has come to a natural ending. On the left hand side, if we go into the negative changes, it hasn't gone all the way. You'll notice here it's gone to the full 10 meter width. On this side, it's gone and stopped at 7.5. The reason is 12D has identified a levee. Now our levee tolerance was set back in our analysis at 0.1 of a meter. So what happens is as 12D moves from the center where the flow line string is, it's looking for a drop of 100 mils. As soon as it finds a 100 millimeter drop, it reverts back to the crest and cuts off that section. So this is where we're saying the maximum left-hand side is at the levee. Now if we want to see our water level depths on this, we certainly can. Let's go up here and add on our flooded widths. So there's our drainage flooded widths. And you can see here, it's truly well contained within this section. If we move farther along, toggle through our chainages, we'll find that the depth gets a little higher, and probably as we get down towards our sag pit, let's go double check to see where we are right now. We'll do a window, tile horizontal, and then a quick way to see where we are is by zooming out just a tad, moving back and forth. So we've moved all the way down to this location. So as we were moving through, I was looking to see if we ever exceeded the top of our road crest, and we didn't. So I wouldn't expect any warnings for exceeding our flooded capacity. So let's just double check that by add on, adding on those warnings. I'm going to turn off our cross sections and our cross section widths, and come back and add on our drainage flooded width capacity warnings. Now there's our flooded width cues, and if we take a look in there, I don't see any strings at all indicating that we've never exceeded the capacity of our road. However, if we wanted to confirm this, we could also come back and go to our strings, sorry, models, model information. And we could go bring up that warning table, 
So we're going down to drainage, flooded with warnings, and you'll see that there's no elements inside there at all. So there definitely are no flooded with, sorry, any discharge warnings where we've exceeded the capacity of our road. Often in the area of a sag pit, you do not want to have flooded with normal depth calculations taking place. Also, if your bypass flow string goes over top of the crown of the road and you're going against a negative grade, you also will not want bypass flow calcs in those areas. So to turn off these flooded width calcs, we can make what are called exclusion zones. So we're going to define this by using a polygon. I'm going to call this DR for drainage, then flooded width exclusions. Now to draw this, once again, I'm going to come to my polygons, all the way out to my freehand polygon. Now what matters here is not the actual zone, but what you're doing is you're fencing your overland flow string. So my plan is to fence it so that it doesn't calculate anywhere in this zone. So I'm going to start my fence right about here, come across to here to fence out that, bring it back across to, I just want to stop it there so I can come to here, and then do my last point across to here. Escape to finish that. Now, if I go back to my network editor, go pick my network, go back to my storm analysis, and then move across to my flooded extents, I'm going to pick my model for my flood exclu exclusion zones. I'm going to put in a DR, and then if I'd like to have a short list of only the models that begin with DR, I can go control D for display. Now the one that I'm looking for is the new one that I've just created called drainage flooded with exclusions. And then now when I go run this, it's going to calculate the flooded widths as before, only when it's all finished, it's going to exclude calculating flooded widths in this area. If you'd like to restrict the flooded width calculations that they're only going to take place upstream of the inlets, one of the things you can do is change your separation to a value of zero. Now that means it will not do any or an infinite number, but rather it will only do them immediately upstream of your inlets. So if we were to go rerun this now, and then move that panel out of the way, you'd see that if we go upstream of our inlets, we have on a calculation of the flooded width immediately there, and you also have one immediately downstream. So you can have an idea of what it gets down to before you start over. Now these strings that have been drawn, of course they have the elevations and the true widths, but they also have all of the details on how they were calculated. If I was to go up to strings, and then down to user, we have this, sorry, file IO, down to user, we have this option that says string attributes to the clipboard. And if I was to go pick that model, I'm going to do a middle mouse for same as, and go pick that flooded width model, I'm going to copy all of those attributes onto the clipboard. Then if I was to go into the Excel program or any other spreadsheet, I'd be able to paste those back in. Now, I'm going to go and expand this so you can see the names. The names are the na flooded widths, overland flow, and the changes along the flow path. Let's take a look at the other values that you have with these. First of all, you've got your, your chainage along them, you've got your reach chainage. Let's expand these so we can more make it a little easier to read them all. There we go. You've got your the pit name, which is the pit immediately downstream. The, sorry, the pit type. There's your pit name, so you know which one you're about to approach. There's your flooded flow. Now that's the flow that's approaching it. The capacity flow, that's the discharge that would overtop the lowest point on your cross section. There's your invert levels, the flood levels, the capacity level, that's just before it overtops. Then your flooded depth, your capacity depth, your flooded width. Now that's the value that you're looking for that you would not want to, pardon me, that's not supposed to exceed your two meters. And your velocity and your velocity times depth. So as you can see, all the different values from your calculations are stored as attributes on these strings and can be easily exported to a report.